Hey everyone, in this video, I wanna come back around to the topic of rotations. We've been using rotations to define the orientation of bodies for a few lessons. Uh, so in this video, what I wanna cover are these four things. Uh, number one, let's go back and retouch on that discussion of simple rotations. Up until now, we've been doing rotations around a shared Z axis. Consider we could also do rotations about a shared X or a shared Y axis. So I wanna give you the formulations for those. Next, uh, points two and three addresses the topic of how do you define general rotations for real world 3D bodies. So uh, I could take this eraser and I could throw it. And as I throw it, it's gonna go through all kinds of rotations. Uh, other examples, um, helicopters, airplanes, rockets, satellites, etc. cetera. Uh, you would approach those problems using one of these two formulations. And then the last one, the rotation matrix, is really how do we use rotations as operators? So if you were going to write uh, some computer code, for example, that automatically took a, a vector in one frame and converted it into another frame, you can do that using the rotations that we define uh, and actually turning them into matrix operators. So uh, let's start by talking about uh, simple rotations. Recall from our previous discussions, a simple rotation is when you have two frames where one of their axes are aligned. For example, we have the black frame that I have drawn, and we could say that there is another frame, a blue frame, where here's the blue X, and here's the blue Y, and we can see that the rotation between them is around this shared Z. So the black Z and the blue Z point in the same direction. There is a single angle of rotation between the two, and that the angle of rotation, uh, so for the way I've drawn it, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's rotating in this direction, and we could have something like that. We could also leave that arrow and draw, instead, now the angle has done this. There. And if we're counting this as a positive rotation, hey, sometimes you go past 180. So uh, that's acceptable as well. In this case, uh, suppose that our black frame was our in frame. So this is x in, y in, and z in. And then our blue frame could be uh, A frame, B frame, uh, you know, just some rotating body frame. So XA, YA, ZA. And we've done the formulation for this approach several times. Uh, this is how we've been defining rotation for all of our problems up until now. We have conveniently selected the Z, uh, usually coming out of the board, uh, to do our diagrams with. And of course, starting with this three-dimensional uh, view of a coordinate frame, if you were to take the Z and you were to pull it out and you, you were to arrange the other two pointing up and right, we can see that the X becomes the one pointing right and the Y becomes the, the one that's the vertical. All right, so uh, what if we don't want to rotate about a shared Z? What if we want to rotate about a shared X or a shared Y? Uh, first of all, why would we want to do that? Well, uh, we're going to see in some problems, um, sometimes it's more convenient to, to set up a problem in, in a certain way, such that you're rotating about one of these other axes. Uh, especially when you get into three-dimensional problems, uh, you're going to spin around one axis and then another joint's going to spin around another. So uh, it tends to make logical sense uh, to do it. And also you just need to be able to do it. So uh, hence why I'm going to give you these formulations. So tell you what, let's, uh, I was a little busy, let's just redraw it. All right, so again, here is the X, here is the Y, here is the Z. Let's say that this time we are rotating about a shared X axis. So <clears throat> imagine that you have the blue frame and the black, fr black frame and initially they're aligned. It's, it's one coordinate frame right on top of another, and then you grab the blue frame by this axis and you start turning it. 
So the, uh, the plane that is going to turn is the zy plane that is spinning uh, about this shared x. So the z-axis and the y-axis are the ones that are now going to rotate. And there's your angle theta. Okay, so uh, what do we need to do with this? Well, we need to make a diagram. I've drawn our normal diagram. One axis is to the right, the other axis is up. Um, and the third axis, the axis of rotation, the shared, is still the, the axis coming out. We're going to do a positive rotation about that axis. So uh, what are these axes now? Well, you've got this three-dimensional frame in front of you. Imagine that we rotate it a little so that the x is pointing out. You can see that these two remaining axes then are the y and z's. So this is y in and this is z in. And then uh, the next direction is coming off of that. So this will be our blue frame. So this is Y A and Z A. The angle between is our angle theta. So let's, uh, let's come up now with the trig expressions that are going to define this rotation. We still have X, Y, and Z. This is X A, Y A, Z A. The shared axis of rotation now is the x. So that means xa equals xn. Okay. Next, uh, let's do the y and the z. So the y axis, for example, um, as far as the diagram goes, the y is now in the place of the x axis. So the form, we can expect a similar form to what we have normally with x. Uh, we can see when theta is equal to zero, that ya is equal to yn, that means it is cosine theta yn. And when theta is equal to 90, it's aligned with zn, that means it is sine theta zn. Next, uh, the z is where the y-axis normally is. When, uh, when theta is equal to zero, then uh, the z is aligned with the z, so that means it's going to be cosine theta zn. And when theta is equal to 90 degrees, that puts your za axis pointing to the left. Uh, so that means it is negative sine theta yn. Okay. So this, for this problem, this would be the rotation from N to A. Same letters that we normally do because we're still defining, right, the rotation between N frame and A frame. It's just now we're doing it about a shared x-axis and the form of this rotation shows that to you because the xA equals xN. Okay, let's do the, uh, let's do the last case. So this time, this uh, shared rotation now, the shared axis, this time we need to rotate about the y-axis. We want to draw the same diagram. We have one axis going up, we have the other axis going right. Imagine that we took this three-dimensional frame and we rotate it such that the y was coming out. If we took it and we just, we just pulled it up a little bit and made that Y come out, then Z is coming up and X is to the left. We then rotate it 90 degrees and that put Z to the right and X is now up. And the Y axis is coming out. So this is uh, Z in, this is X in, and then the axis coming off. If you spin the Y axis, then it's the Z X frame that is, a, or a, a plane that is rotating. So this is Z A and X A. The angle between them, theta. All right, so X A equals Y A equals and Z hat A equals. Shared axis this time, shared axis is the Y. So Y A equals Y N. 
Next, uh, we don't have to do these in, a, in any particular order. Uh, the Z is in the is in normally in the X direction, so we can handle that one first. Uh, when theta is equal to zero, Z A is aligned with Z N, so we know that that's uh, that's cosine. So this is cosine theta Z N, and when theta is equal to ninety, it's aligned with X, so we know that that's sine. So sine theta X N plus. <clears throat> the uh, the x-axis, well, when theta is equal to zero, xa is aligned with xn. We know that that is cosine. And then when uh, theta is 90, it, xa points this way, that puts it in the negative z in direction, so we know that that is negative sine. There we go. Okay, so this then is R in A. All right, so uh, you've already got the shared Z in your notes. We just did shared X, here's the form for shared Y. These are the three simple rotations. It does not matter what kind of problem you're working. It doesn't matter the geometry. If you do a simple rotation, it is one of these three uh, forms every time. The only thing that would make it change is if, uh, is if you set up a left-handed coordinate frame, which conventionally is wrong. So uh, as long as you're doing right-handed coordinate frames, you're doing sh uh, simple rotations about some shared axis, boom, one of those three. Okay, let's clean this up uh, and let's talk about those other two topics on general rotations, uh, Euler angles, Euler parameters. Suppose you're designing an airplane and you want to define the orientation of this airplane. Uh, you can use what is usually called roll pitch yaw, but understand roll pitch yaw is actually a specific application of Euler angles. So Euler angles is if you uh, stage a series of simple rotations, one after the next. Consider, uh, we've got an airplane in front of us and we have three axes coming off of this airplane. Let's call forward X, Y is coming off of the right wing, and then Z, usually points uh, down. There you go, there's your z-axis. Uh, if you do a simple rotation about the x-axis, you can imagine the, uh, the airplane is going to do this. This is called roll, and the angle for this one is um, uh, phi or phi. Uh, next, if you do a simple rotation about the y-axis, that is pitch, and the angle for this one is theta. If you do a simple rotation about z, then you're, you're turning the thing left and right like you're changing a heading. Uh, and this is called yaw. And the angle we use for this one is Greek letter psi. So uh, imagine you have an airplane that uh, does a roll and a pitch and a yaw at the same time. Uh, you can imagine then that this airplane is now occupying some other kind of arbitrary uh, orientation. Clearly, it's not aligned with the Z-frame any longer. So we can, if we want, we can define the rotation of this using uh, a series of these roll pitch yaws. So uh, suppose that we do uh, a rotation around, and we can do them in this order. We could say roll, pitch, Yaw. So let's do a rotation around X, and then a rotation around Y, and then a rotation about Z. We could write it this way. We could also write it in terms of these Greek letters. We could say that uh, we're doing a rotation uh, using uh, phi was first, and then a rotation around uh, theta, and then a rotation around psi. Sometimes you'll see this written in combinations of these, so they might put Rx, they might put Ry, and an Rz, that's fine. Uh, how could we do this using uh, the notation we have been using up until this point? Well, suppose that we have, um, we could define some rotation into A, and then we could go A to B frame, and then we could go uh, B to C frame something like that. So you can imagine this whole series of rotations just being cascaded. Now, do we have to choose these three axes in this order? No. Consider we could uh, define a rotation doing um, 
we could do a yaw first, and then we could come in and we could do pitch, and then we could come in and we could do a roll. Now, each time you do this, understand it's like there's an intermediate frame, right? You do a roll and you go to a different frame, and then you do a pitch off of that frame, and then you do a yaw off of that frame. Um, that's one way to do it, where you're, you're acting on the intermediate frames. Another way to do it is regardless of the orientation of the craft, when we say yaw, we mean rotate around inertial Z, or when we say pitch, we mean rotate about inertial Y. That's also valid. The, the form of these will take uh, slightly different. It's like using uh, three absolute angles compared to three relative angles. Now, it gets even more complex than this. Uh, we don't actually have to do a roll, a pitch, and a yaw. We could do a roll and a pitch, and we could do another roll after that. And that will get you to any arbitrary frame. We could do a roll and a yaw and another roll. We could do pitch, yaw, pitch, and on and on it goes. You can pick any three combinations of roll, pitch, yaw, and that will give you an arbitrary rotation. The, uh, the only rule there is that you can't do the same thing twice. For example, if we did um, a roll, and then we do another roll. That means I, I took my eraser and I turned it around one axis and I turned it around another axis. Or, or I just, you know, I turned it a little bit this way and then a little bit that way, but it's, it's the same axis. By doing a roll and then a roll, these are around the same shared X. So you could have just combined them into a single roll with a different angle. If this one is negative 10 degrees and this one is 130 degrees, then congratulations, you just did a 120 degree roll. So if you do the same axis um, consecutively, it's like you're only doing one action. So what that means is uh, you go through and you make some pick of uh, roll pitch yaw in some order where they're not repeated, and then that is a valid set of Euler angles. Now, depending on uh, the order that you select them, um, you get slightly different behavior as far as the math goes, but you can still go from your non-moving inertial frame to your uh, generalized rotation for your 3D body. Now, uh, there is one big caveat to using Euler angles. It turns out that it doesn't matter which combination you use or which ones you use. Every single formulation of Euler angles uh, is susceptible to a very specific mathematical failure, um, which is usually in this, in this application, it's usually called a singularity. Uh, the term singularity is, is used in a lot of different places and it usually means um, some, somewhere, some theoretical point where the, the math becomes untenable or maybe you're dividing by zero. Uh, in a case where it can't be resolved, or you know, you think of like a black hole or something where the volume is supposed to go to zero, uh, etc. So in this case, what the singularity means is that uh, if you were on board this craft and you were attempting to recover these angles, the roll, pitch, yaw angles, uh, then in a very particular orientation, which for this application uh, is also called gimbal lock, maybe you've heard of gimbal lock, uh, but when you're in this very specific orientation, you are no longer able to recover uh, some of these angles for the, the roll pitch yaw, um, which can have devastating effects if you're attempting to run a control system on this airplane, which, hey, you probably are. So uh, what do we do about that? How do we avoid this singularity? Well, uh, first of all, it's uh, understanding where the singularity is going to occur. So suppose that we do a standard uh, roll pitch, yaw. And let's say that this y-axis, uh, let's say in the, the arrangement that we've done right now, let's say that you roll for zero and you yaw for zero, and then the pitch angle is positive, or sorry, positive going this way. So uh, the pitch angle is now negative 90 degrees. Well, at negative 90 degrees, what has happened? The roll angle 
the front of the aircraft is now pointing straight down. So the x-axis is now aligned with uh, what, is, what is nominally the z-axis for the airplane. If we rotate it in the other direction and we put the nose of the airplane straight up, um, first of all, the airplane is going to stall, not the point, but the x-axis is now aligned with, uh, you know, nominally the, the z-axis in that direction. So what is the result of this? The result is that uh, mathematically, you can no longer deconstruct that final answer to get the roll and yaw angles. Um, it, when, the, when the first and the third axes, right, in this case it's the roll and yaw, but when the first and third uh, rotation axes become aligned, and notice that there's two different angles that got you there, positive 90 or negative 90, uh, you can no longer tell the difference between a roll and a yaw. They, have the, they would have the same effect mathematically. If we spun the airplane first and then we aligned them, we couldn't tell mathematically whether that, uh, the spinning of the airplane was a result of the roll or the yaw. That's the point. And it doesn't matter which arrangement of Euler angles you pick, there is always uh, some angle in the middle that results on the two axes for the outside being aligned. And that's, that is a problem. It's a mathematical problem. So what do we do? Um, we can avoid it. We can avoid the singularity by selecting an order of Euler angles that is a, appropriate for your craft. Consider if this is a um, commercial airliner, then we assume that the airplane is never going to point straight up, nor is it ever going to point straight down. So during normal operation, the singularity should never even be uh, achieved. We shouldn't, we shouldn't get into that orientation. Similarly, if this were uh, a helicopter, uh, and the helicopter, we're designing it, and we specify that this helicopter is only going to go through uh, a known set of angles, something like this. The helicopter is never intended to be inverted. Uh, then we can select some Euler angles where the singularity is unachieved in that performance as well. What if, um, what if you're doing something like a satellite, though, and satellites are going to go through all kinds of orientations during normal operation? Uh, that means that it is actually inappropriate to use Euler angles. Or you can use them and maybe if you approach a singularity, you, you switch to a different definition of different combination of roll pitch yaws. There are ways to get around it. Um, the point is, what I'm saying now though, is that there's actually another approach to do general 3D angles. Uh, and I'm not gonna give you all the formulations for it, we're just gonna talk about it broadly. Uh, and that's no longer Euler angles, it's another one called Euler parameters. So let me clean this up, we'll talk about that. This other approach, Euler parameters, it allows you to find a general 3D rotation, and this time we're actually going to use four coordinates instead of just three. Uh, remember with the Euler angles, the roll pitch all, we had three angles, right? It was, it was one about X, one about Y, one about Z. Um, or depending on the combination, X, Y, X, Y, Z, Y, etc. This time, let's approach this rotation from a, a different perspective. Instead of rotating about X and Y and Z, uh, let's say that any real world object that occupies any final orientation can get to that final orientation by identifying some other axis to rotate about. So instead of rotating around X and Y and Z, what if there was an axis that was just pointed in this direction? And what if we spun around that axis? If so, we could get this eraser into all kinds of positions, right? And we, we would only do it once. We find some axis, and then we spin around that axis. And it can get us into any arbitrary rotation. So that means that there is some axis pointing off like this. This is called the principal axis of rotation. Nice name. Um, where is this axis? Well, we can define its position with a series of angles that measure with respect to the three main axes. So we could say here's theta one, here's theta two, and here's theta three. So there exists some uh, principal axis that we can find using these angles, and then we want to rotate around this principal axis using another angle, phi, phi however you want to call it. So uh, these four angles, we turn these four angles into four new generalized coordinates. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, E0, E1, E2, E3. Sometimes you will see the same uh, approach and uh, just depending on who the, the researcher or the engineer is, they might label these things E2, uh, sorry, E1, E2, E3, E4. That's okay. Just look at the math of how they're defining these things and usually uh, the E0 is what's getting relabeled as E4. That's a, it's okay. <clears throat> ends up being the same thing. Uh, from these four generalized coordinates, we can construct uh, rotations that define how to get from the end frame, the black frame, um, to a final frame. Now, here's the interesting thing. This blue axis, this blue axis is not the X, the Y, the Z of the final frame. You're taking this blue axis and you're spinning it. And from that spin, we can get a whole new axis that has a, an arbitrary orientation. So if we started at Zn, uh, here is Za, here is Ya, here is Xa. Okay. So we didn't rotate the, the A-frame very much, right? But it would be like if I, uh, if I pulled a, an axis coming right out and I spun it just a little, right? Just a little small spin. But we can see that XA, YA, and ZA have all changed by rotating around this blue axis. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the, uh, that's the basic idea with Euler parameters. You now have four generalized coordinates, uh, but we've been talking about constraints and degrees of freedom. There's only three degrees of freedom in a general rotation. You can get there using roll, pitch, and yaw. Uh, so if you cook up an extra generalized coordinate, that means that there has to be a constraint that goes with these. And there is one. It's a normality constraint. It turns out that all of these, when you square them and add them together, all of these have to equal one. So if you use this approach, you have four generalized coordinates for a three degree of freedom system, and you have to make sure that this constraint is always being enforced. So, it's, um, it's fun, in my opinion, implementing all the parameters. Uh, they allow you to do some very impressive uh, motion and rotation of your body if you want to do something like high performance aircraft or spacecraft, something like that. Uh, this is a good way to approach it. Uh, okay, so uh, with all that said, there was uh, a fourth topic that I wanted to dig into in this video and it's how to do uh, rotations as linear operators. So let me clean this up and we'll hit that last topic. Let's start by writing down the trig expressions for simple rotation. And the one we're most familiar with is around a shared Z. So let's say uh, XA, YA, ZA. And we're all familiar with how this goes. Cosine, sine and then a negative sine and cosine. Okay, and for now I'm just going to leave this bottom one blank. Uh, next, I'm going to add something to this. I'm going to add this understood zero zn, all right? And I'm going to add on the last term, there's an understood zero xn and a zero yn and then a one zn. All right, so where do we go from here? Well, I want you to imagine that this left-hand side is a vector. The dimensions of it are three by one. Uh, what kind of vector is it? It uh, honestly doesn't matter. It could be a position vector, it could be uh, velocity, it could be force, etc. Uh, but there is some three by one vector here on the left hand side. Next, notice that the right hand side has its own bases. Uh, the, the bases of the left side are the a axes, so the bases of the right side are the z axes. Uh, x in, um, uh, sorry, a, a and uh, n, there we go. So X, Y, Z, A, X, Y, Z, N. Imagine that we took these uh, in-frame bases and we extract them from these terms to the right. So what I mean is we can come in here and we can say, all right, here is a 
vector off on the right hand side and that is xn, yn, and zn. So there's the vectors on the right hand side, the, uh, the bases. And then what will be left in the middle? Well, if you extract these bases to the right, then what you're left in the middle with is, a, uh, is some linear algebra terms. So perhaps, depending on where you are in your, uh, your school program, maybe you haven't studied linear algebra much, that's okay. I'm not, uh, not going to make you do any linear algebra here, but I think this will make sense. What is left behind is a three by three matrix containing these math terms. Sine theta, cosine theta, zero, and zero, zero, one. Okay, so what we have just done is we've just shown that these trig terms that we've been writing, you can take those trig terms, you can put them into a matrix, the three by three matrix, so the left-hand side is three by one, the right-hand side has to also be three by one, uh, and we get there doing a three by three multiplied by a three by one. So here is, uh, here is A frame on the left, and consider the order of operations here. The input to this process is really a vector in the N frame. This is the input, and then you multiply it, you pre-multiply it with this rotation, and it yields the left-hand side, which is the exact same, uh, the exact same vector in a different frame now, right? So we went from the in frame to the a frame. And um, interesting thing about this matrix that we've just drawn, it has a norm of one. This rotation matrix, because that's what it is now. This rotation matrix has a magnitude of one, a norm of one, and it has that norm of one if you were to normalize any of the rows, they would have a, a norm of one, uh, and also any of the columns. Every single one of these all has a norm of one. So when I say normalize, how would you normalize this vector? You take all the individual components, you square them, you add them together. So if you normalize the, uh, if you find the magnitude of the middle row, it's sine squared plus cosine squared. That's one. Um, find the magnitude of the middle column, sine squared plus cosine squared, right? Find the magnitude of the final column, zero plus zero plus zero, one, right? So uh, this rotation matrix, it will not scale your vector any. It, it won't stretch it or shrink it. The only thing it's going to do is it's going to define it in a different frame. Now, what do we call this rotation matrix? Uh, this is going to seem a little weird because we're actually going to reverse some things here. <clears throat> so uh, this is just how this is called in, um, in industry, in textbooks, and research. Uh, when you're going from the N to the A frame, this specific matrix that we've just done, uh, it's actually this. It's, it's, it's a reversal of the, uh, of the letters from what we're used to defining. Um, and, and that's just how it is, you know, in the, uh, uh, in the jargon of this field. If you're going the other direction, if you were, if you took this and you formulated it such that you're going from A to n, uh, then you're going to do the other, uh, the other one, and that's, uh, there you go, n on top. So, uh, what's the relationship between these two things? Let me clean this up a bit. So, we said that if you took uh, some vector, and let's say it's, a, let's say it's a position vector, so we take the position vector from n to a, and let's say that's initially in the n frame. And let's say that we want the position vector into a, and we want it in the a frame. So we have to do a rotation. We can accomplish that by pre-multiplying this position vector with that matrix that we just came up with. And again, notice the, uh, notice the order of the letters. So this is your three by three, this is your three by one, and it yields your answer a three by one. We can go the other direction. We could take that exact same position vector, P into A in the A frame, and if we want that position vector in a different frame, we're going to take the rotation, 
and we're going to do it in the opposite direction. We're going to go from the A-frame to the N-frame. The dimensions are the same, three by three. Uh, so what's the relationship between these two rotation matrices? The relationship between them is a transpose every time. And if you took this and you transposed it again, you would get this answer back. Uh, so those rotations that I've been having you define repeatedly on every problem, um, what we really use them for is we don't do this stuff by hand. We put it into a computer as a three by three matrix. You can imagine uh, this even being a function call. You can write a function where you provided an angle uh, or you, you provided a variable, right? The, the variable theta one, and it takes theta one and it puts it into those trig expressions and it returns a three by three matrix. So that's how, we, uh, that's how we put this stuff into code. Okay, uh, in the future, when you're working problems, if you want to do things in MATLAB or C or Python or something, and you want to take advantage of this kind of linear algebra, be my guess, be my absolute guess. Any problem you want to solve using code, go for it. Um, and the only comment that I have on there is if you're going to use some kind of software tools, uh, you need to print uh, whatever code you write. You need to include... Um, uh, outputs and you know any plots anything like that and show that to the grader okay so uh, that's it for this video um, so this gave you all of the uh, the simple rotation throughout other axes and a nice little introduction to some other formulations as well so uh, that's it for now best of luck I'll see you around